welcome to Bible Study Hub. I'm Ann Wiggins, and I'm so glad that you're with us as we finish up the book of Genesis. Yes, we are going to finish it up tonight. I'm so excited to do that. And then I'll tell you at the end what we're going to study next. I get so excited about those things. So just as a little item of housekeeping, if you want your name to show up along with your comments as you make comments, just go ahead and go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook and just give it permission and it will do that for you. Sometimes it expires. Even if you've done it in the past, you might have to go back and kind of reboot the whole thing. So if you want to, that would be great. So just to kind of bring us up to speed as we wrap it up tonight, we have been studying the life of Joseph. And Joseph has now moved his entire extended family all the way from Canaan into Egypt, where he is, by extension, taking care of them as he's taking care of all of the Egyptians. And they're stationed in this land called Goshen, which is kind of off and away, away from the other Egyptians. You can see the plan and purpose of God in that because they're not able to really intermarry with the Egyptians. In fact, God has made it so the Egyptians hate shepherds. They just find them detestable and abominable. Well, guess what God in his providence has the, the little fledgling nation of Israel, the family of Israel doing? They're shepherds. So there's really no chance here that they're going to be intermarrying and mixing with each other, which is precisely what God wants. So now it is time for Jacob to finally go home to be with the Lord to be with his his dad, his grandfather, and others who've passed on. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 48, verses 1 to 2. So here we go. It says, After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Now, if you remember these two sons of Joseph from an Egyptian wife, Manasseh, firstborn, Ephraim, secondborn. So all we know here is that Joseph brings his two sons to visit their grandfather because it looks like he's dying soon. I don't know that Joseph really had any idea what was about to happen. Maybe he had been tipped off, but I kind of doubt it. I think he's just bringing them to see their grandpa probably one last time before he passes away. What he probably doesn't know is what is about to happen here, which is really interesting. Verses three to six. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples, and I will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. The land is always a huge part of the Abrahamic covenant passed down. It is the land that belongs to them, and it is an everlasting possession. It's forever. Pretty, pretty amazing. And now your two sons, verse five, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Okay. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So what is actually happening here, if you're not quite sure of what's happening, Jacob is formally adopting his grandsons as his own sons. Now, the significance of this is really, really big. Have you ever wondered why of the 12 tribes of Israel, there is no tribe of Joseph? Has anybody ever said, yeah, I've, I've thought about that. I've kind of wondered, like, he was such a great guy. Like, he was the best guy. <laughs> How come there's no tribe named after him? Well, the reason why is because what Jacob is saying is, I'm going to give you, Joseph, a double portion of the blessing. And in order to give you a double portion, I need not one person, but two people. So I am going to adopt your sons as my own. They will be listed in the line with your brothers. So he's kind of like taking the generations and doing this and just evening it out. He says, just like Simeon is mine and Reuben is mine, so will be Ephraim 
and Manasseh. One other little teeny tiny thing that may have kind of gone past you, but I want to point it out because we're going to read about this more in a second, is that Ephraim was the younger. Manasseh was the older. Therefore, what Jacob should have said is, I'm going to adopt your boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, but he doesn't. He says Ephraim and Manasseh. He reverses the order and we're about to find out why he does that. Um, what do I want to do here? I think I want to jump down to verse eight. Let's go to verse eight, eight to 12. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? He's blind now. He's old. Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. He said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel, this is Jacob, were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth to show honor and respect. So Joseph or Jacob just says, I never dreamed I would ever see you again. And now just look at this. You know, he's just, he's praising God. I know I, not only did I see you, but God let me see your sons too. I mean, that's amazing. But now is where things get really interesting. Verses 13 to 14. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand. So you can kind of picture this. And Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near to him. So what he's doing right now is he's arranging the boys so that Manasseh, the elder, will be at his father's right hand. So that's my right hand. Um, what he's doing with Ephraim is arranging him so that he will be at the left hand. Why? Because the right hand is always the place of honor. Uh, the left hand would be secondary, oldest, youngest. So that's what we have going. But watch what happens. Verse 14, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim the younger, who was younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So after Joseph so carefully arranges this so it will be right, his dad completely blindsides him. Uh, blindsides him. You can see him kind of like mustering up his strength. He can't see anymore. We've got it arranged. The boys are in the right spot. And he reaches out to bless and he he does this number. We're going to read what um, Joseph's response to that was here in just a second, but he's just completely shocked and blown away by this. So it says in verses 15 to 16, and he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. This is so touching. His One of his last words the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys and in them let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Well, he's formally now adopting them and he's prophesying as well that they will grow into their own tribes, and into a multitude of people. But here's Joseph's response to it. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Can you picture this? And Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head, speaking of Manasseh, but his father refused and said, I know my son, I know he also, also shall become a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. 
So he blessed them that day saying, by you, Israel will pronounce blessings saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. All right. Well, let's go on a little bit here. Um, you know what? Let, let me stop and let, let me just ask you a question real quick. I wasn't going to do this, but I think I want to. If you kind of think back who God chose, I mean, first of all, he picks Abraham out of this like polytheistic culture for no particular reason other than he just chooses him. And then Abraham has Ishmael and Isaac. Remember, Ishmael was the by far eldest son by like over a decade. Well, I think it was like 17 years or something, 15 years. Um, but God chooses the younger, Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau's the one, they're twins, who comes out first. He's the one who should be the chosen one, but he's not. God chooses Jacob. And then Jacob has all these different sons, but he chooses his son's um, grandchildren that he's not the firstborn. And, and then even of the grandchildren, <laughs> he chooses the younger of the two to be the one that receives the most blessing. So what, what I'm trying to establish here is when God chooses somebody, he typically chooses the most unlikely candidate. And I just wonder if, if while you're commenting here, all I want you to do is if you feel like that's you, just type yes. That You don't have to explain it. You don't have to say anything else. Just type yes into the comments. And don't do it just because you see a lot of people doing it. And it seems like the right thing to do. And don't do it for that reason. What I'm trying to get you to do here is to really think about your own situation and to, to look at yourself and go, am I really the kind of person? That a God who created the whole universe would want to choose for his service and to be his child. Am I that great? Because I'll tell you, I've I've thought that with myself so many times. Like I just I ask him sometimes, God, I I, I do not know. I do not know why you would look down from heaven on a little girl who was afraid of everything, <laughs> everything. I spent my whole childhood just crying about stuff. I don't know how my mother stood it. I was terrified of the whole world. Why he would choose me to be his child, it blows my mind. It humbles me to the core. I don't understand it. The most unlikely candidate. So um, looking at your comments here and seeing lots of yeses come out of there. Um, that you're saying with me, I, I don't get it. I don't know why. I think it's a beautiful thing to think about. God is definitely in the business of choosing the most unlikely candidates, isn't he? Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> if he's looking for the, the brightest and best, I'd be completely lost. I, I would have no shot at it. Well, let's go on to verses 21 to 22. Then Israel said to Joseph, behold, I am about to die. But God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So again, we have more references to the land always being part of the promise. And it's a specific area of land that he's speaking of there. Let's go on to chapter 49. Are you ready? We're almost there. Chapter 49 verses 1 to 2. The story continues. Then Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Don't miss that. This is more than just a blessing. This is more than just him saying, may God be good to you. May you be blessed. May you be fruitful. This It is those things. But it's much more than that. He says, I'm going to prophesy right now. I'm going to tell you what will become of you, what will become of your families. Pretty interesting. He says, assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Now, I'm actually going to skip over verses 3 to 27. It's kind of a study in and of itself. I really wanted to get to the end of this, so I'll give you a little synopsis here. But basically, he starts going through his sons from the eldest to the youngest, and he 
gives these prophecies slash blessings to his boys. And everything that he says does come true. It's really interesting for just an example. Reuben does not really get a blessing at all. He pretty much just says you're going to be small and insignificant in so many words. And guess what tribe was always small, insignificant, nobody great came from it. No kings, no priests, no prophets, no nobody came from the tribe of Reuben. It came true. He talks about Zebulun being on the coast. Well, guess where Zebulun's family, his tribe, eventually settles when they go back to the promised land in 400 years? On the coast. <laughs> um, Benjamin's tribe, he, he describes as being warriors. And Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, was known to just be fierce and good fighters. They were the best warriors, like the they were the, the Navy SEALs of the tribes. The only tribe I really want to spend a little time focusing on here is the tribe of Judah. And if you know anything about Jesus and where he came from, you will know immediately why that's the one tribe I want to kind of carve out and talk about for a second. So let's look at verses 9 to 12. He says of Judah, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness, who dares to rouse him? And then here's where I want to camp out. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. The whole world will obey. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Well, if you go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5, you will find out that Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what he's talking about here has several, call them horizons, in which this prophecy will be fulfilled and come true. So the shortest term was that Judah indeed was the tribe from which the kings came from. Starting with King David, they all came through the line of Judah, including Jesus. So that would be like the shortest term on the horizon. If you go a little bit beyond the kings, you find that, as we just said, Jesus himself as the Messiah, the, the coming ruler, did also come from the tribe of Judah. But if you go long term, like the long pass on the football field, way at the end, we're not even there yet. Jesus is the one from whom the scepter will never depart. He will rule and reign the entire world forever, starting in the millennial kingdom. But then, of course, even beyond that, he will be our king, our Messiah, our God forever and ever and ever. So as, as Jacob is giving this prophecy, I mean, it's just goosebump inducing, isn't it, to think how long the range was. And I'm sure Jacob didn't really fully understand a lot of what he was saying. Uh, he was definitely speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I think often the prophets said things or wrote things, and then they kind of looked to see like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> what I just said, what I just wrote, what does that mean? Sometimes they didn't even know themselves. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Let's go on to verses 28 to 32. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, the promised land, which Abraham brought, bought with... Um, with the field from Ephron, the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. Okay, so he's just saying, take me back to where Abraham is buried. That's probably an easier way to uh, kind of synthesize it. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife, he continues. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. Remember that Rachel had died on the road in childbirth, so she did not get to be buried there, but Leah was. 
When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Well, as I've been saying over and over, here we have more stuff about the land. He wants to be taken back to the land, super important to him. Um, he wants to be buried there as a signal and a sign to them that he believed God, that God had given them that land. So that's why he's saying that. Joseph is so sad. In chapter 50, verses 1 to 2, it says, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. So I love in the Bible when we can see godly men and women who truly, sincerely grieve the loss of a loved one. I think there is something oh, so, how do I, just so sweet about knowing that that's not sinful. You know, sometimes we're tempted to think, why am I still so sad about the passing of a parent or a sibling or a friend or, you know, what somebody that you were really, really close to? Why can't I seem to get over this? You know what? Because death is separation and it's really hard. And it's really sad. Even when we all know the Lord, it's still okay to be really sad. You see this with the very godly man, Joseph. He falls on his father and kisses him and weeps and holds him, even though he's not there anymore. That is a sign to us that grieving is a gift from God. And the grieving process is how he helps us deal with that. And it is not bad. It is good to grieve the loss of a loved one. For any of you going through that, don't you ever, ever feel guilty about that. The Bible multiple times lets us know that it is very appropriate. That was the word I was looking for. So the Egyptians, of course, embalm. Um, the Jewish people do not embalm. Later on, there will be very specific instructions given from the Lord on when to bury, how to bury, the whole thing, how that is to be handled. and taken care of. This is prior to that instruction. So of course, because Joseph is number two in the land of Egypt, this is how they do it. This is how he is going to have it done for his father as well. So they take 40 days and they embalm. I actually looked up how they did it. Don't really want to talk about it. I'll tell you what, that's not for the faint of heart, especially back then. So anyway, um, jo Jacob is mourned for for 70 days in Egypt. Really a high honor for a man who was a family of shepherds. <laughs> Remember that the Egyptians did not have any regard for shepherds, but because of Joseph, they had high regard for his father and they really honor him in this way, which is beautiful. Uh, verses four to six now. When the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh saying, my father made me swear saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, go up, bury your father as he made you swear. This is actually a little, a little risky for Pharaoh. What if Joseph doesn't come back? What if he goes up and he stays? He's lost his number two guy, the one who's in charge of all of this. It's definitely a concern. I think it's why Joseph so incredibly respectfully approaches Pharaoh through not even he's been mourning. He's probably in mourning garb. You know, in those days, you don't go before the king, the leader of the country, unless you are cleaned up and perfect and looking good and happy. So he doesn't want to go before him on his own. He sends some other people to say, here's the deal. Would you allow me please to go bury my father? And Pharaoh, because he trusts Joseph so much, says, go do it. If that's what your father wanted, go do it. Verses seven to nine. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, 
and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. Now, when I first read that they had left the children behind, I thought to myself, well, of course they did. Is there any mother in the group who doesn't know exactly what that was all about? I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm not taking the kids to a funeral. No, nope, not after a long trip like that. They'll never make it. We're leaving them behind. But I actually think there was another reason that they did that. Although I'm pretty sure that played it. Um, the other reason was, again, to give assurance to Pharaoh that he was coming back. Like, I'm going to leave my children and my wealth behind. That way you don't have any concerns that I'm going to somehow decide to stay. I'll be back. I left all the good stuff back home. Um, verses 10 to 14 tell us about the, the burial procession and um, all of that going on. You can read that on your own. I'm going to jump down to verse 15 now. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Do you sense a guilty conscience happening here? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. All right, group, I have a question for you, and I would love for you to comment. What do you think? Did Jacob really tell the boys that? Did he? Do you think he did? Do you think he said to the, to the boys, hey, after I die, I want you to go to Joseph, and I want you to tell him that I asked for him not to retaliate against you. To, to, he He's supposed to forgive you guys. That's my wish. I want you guys to tell him that. Do you think that that really happened? Interested to see. Yeah. Interested to see your comments here. What do you think? All right. Sandy's just flat out. She's no. <laughs> She's like, nope. <laughs> I don't think that. I don't think it happened. <laughs> Emily says, I don't think Jacob really said that. He seemed to never address it. Yeah, maybe too painful for him, perhaps. And, and you're right. He never does seem to really address it. Um, somebody else, um, let's see, Roberta says, I don't think Jacob said that. Someone else says, nope. Um, Susie says, I don't believe he did. He would have told Joseph himself. <laughs> All right. Lori says, no, no, and no. She's a solid no. Carolyn says, nope, I don't think he did. Uh, Dottie said, well, they aren't known for being truthful, which is so true. Alan says, most likely not. All right. I love it when you all come to the exact same conclusions that I did, because that's exactly what I thought for the reasons that you all kind of gave there. Like, really? You think that Jacob wouldn't just say to Joseph, hey, by the way, really appreciate how you've treated your brothers. I would assume and hope that you would continue to do that after I'm gone. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, Joseph has been such a man of God. How many times did he have the opportunity to extract some, you know, serious pain from these guys, like really inflict some stuff on them? And he doesn't do it. He's completely forgiven them. He has demonstrated this to them. So I agree with you. I think the brothers see that dad is no longer there. They remember all the terrible things that they did to their brother that led to where they are now. And they say to themselves, dad's not here anymore. What if, what if he comes after us? 
what if he takes us out? What if he slaughters us? And so they figure better tell him that dad said, don't do that. And, and I think it's interesting too, that Joseph cries when they come to him with that. And the Bible doesn't tell us why he's crying about it. Does, I mean, there's possibilities, I guess, is he, does he feel sad that they're lying again? Um, is he just sad that they would even think and suggest that after all these years that he's taken care of them so lavishly that he would turn on them? Is he kind of crying because it's the first time they've ever really said, like, we admit that we were wrong? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out someday. I just wrote down for myself just a, a few lessons I think that we can extract from this passage here. One is don't spend your life waiting for apologies. Just don't because they rarely come. Isn't that the truth? You almost never have people who have really hurt you. I'm not talking about like somebody bumps into you. Oh, sorry, not that type. I'm talking about the devastating things, the things that you are owed an apology because whatever somebody did to you was really, really wrong and traumatizing. You probably won't get the apology. Maybe you will, but don't spend your life waiting for it. Um, number two, even if you don't get a valid apology, forgive anyway. You have to. The Bible tells us that we have to. So don't hang on to it. Don't just put it behind you. Like just Forgive and yourself move on. Just move on. And, and if you continue to have it roll over and over in your mind, the best thing you can do, it's going to sound weird, but it works. Just out loud, when those thoughts hit you, just say next and, and get it out of your mind and get something else in your mind. I have found if I just say the word next, you'll hear me at home. next. <laughs> it helps. I don't know why. It just, maybe it won't work for you, but it works for me. Um, it, here's another lesson. If, if we are the offenders and we need to apologize, apologize quickly, you know, and thoroughly and get it out of the way so that the person doesn't have to deal with that trauma of your not even caring enough to say that you were sorry. And I wasn't going to do this. I, I just, sometimes I just throw stuff in here. I used to years and years and years ago when my kids were much younger. I used to teach parenting classes at our church. It was it was great. I'm I'm so far out of the parenting scene. I don't do it anymore because I feel like I'm not I, I I'm not in it. But one of the things we used to tackle in class was the anatomy of an actual apology because it's so important to teach your children how to apologize. An apology does not sound like I'm sorry you were offended. I'm sorry you took that the wrong way. That those are not apologies and derivatives of such, not apologies. It doesn't make the person feel better and you take no responsibility. An apology says, I, and then fill in the blank, I hurt you, I yelled at you, I stole from you, whatever it is that you did, I did this to you. I am guilty, I feel terrible, I am so sorry. And I just need to ask, would you find it in your heart to forgive me? Boy, those are hard words to say. They're so hard because they're so humbling. It's hard to go to somebody that you've offended, legitimately offended, and ask for something that you have no control over whether or not they'll give it to you, which is their forgiveness. But I'll tell you what, keep short accounts. Get the stuff on the table. If you need to email it, email it. If you need to do it in person, do it in person. If you need to pick up the phone, pick up the phone. But I think what you will find if you have a number of these things lingering that like you haven't apologized for that you should have at some point in time, it's not too late unless they're no longer alive, then obviously you can't. But as long as you're still here, it's not too late. Go ahead and do that. And then leave the results in the hands of them and the Lord. You've done everything that you can do to apologize. Well, <laughs> to the most important statement of the passage after all of that, let, let, me, let me pop it up again. This is verse 20, like part of verse 20. Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Wow. You realize what he's saying here? I mean, he's saying a number of things. First of all, like 
yeah, you're responsible, but I don't hold you. I don't hold you in contempt because what you did wrong as it was, God used it. We so often talk about suffering in this world and people say, how can a holy, righteous God allow suffering? There are a number of reasons why he does, but this is one of them. And we've talked about this throughout the book of Genesis, how something that you can see the fingerprints of Satan on, how he comes along, horrible things happen to people and God somehow, some way, in ways only he can do in his sovereignty, he flips that thing on its head and he ends up using it for good. If that doesn't give you encouragement tonight, I don't know what will. When you're going through hard times, it's wonderful and legitimate to say to the Lord, Lord, this is awful and I hate it. Would you please not waste it in my life? Don't waste this trial. Use it in whatever way you want to. Bring good out of this some way, somehow, no matter how big or how little, use it. And I, I can tell you, he will. It might take a while before you actually see it. it. Took a lot of years for Joseph to really see it. But wow, God is amazing that way. Let's go to verses 25 to 26. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And there, unlike his father, he will actually have his remains remain in Egypt for about 400 years before Moses gathers his bones together on right on the eve of like when they get out of um, Egypt and cross over the Red Sea and all of, you know, the story probably right before they do that, Moses gets his hands on these bones and he's like, they're coming with us because we promised this guy that he will not be buried forever in Egypt, but he will be taken to the promised land. So let's go to a little wrap up because that is the end of the book of Genesis. I'm going to pop up something. I sat down this afternoon and I just started brainstorming something. And here's what I was thinking. The book of Genesis is a highly attacked book of the Bible. I don't know if you're aware of that, but many, many people who call themselves scholars, some of them are, really go after the historicity and the truthfulness, the veracity of the book of Genesis. They'll say things like, it's poetry. It's not meant to be literal. Like, you know, if you believe that stuff actually happened, sorry for you. Um, they will say things like, well, you know, it's, it's analogous. So, so it's, um, you know, this represents this and, and the ark represents such and such and the tower of Babel didn't really happen, but it represents this. And we're supposed to have stories taught to us. It is so attacked. And there's a good reason why, because the book of Genesis basically helps the world that we live in totally make sense. I don't know how long you've known the Lord or if you even know the Lord yet. Hopefully you will if you don't if you don't yet. But if you were an adult when you came to Christ, you may remember a time in your life when life in general, I'm talking about the world around you, made no sense and was really really scary as a result. If you understand the book of Genesis, the world around you starts to make an awful lot of sense. Let me just, these are my brainstorms. So I'm just going to pop them up here, just one at a time. If you understand Genesis, you know where you came from. Were you an accident? No. Did you evolve from goo? No. You came from God. God created Adam and Eve, and he created you. So you have a purpose in your life. You understand that if you understand the book of Genesis. Incidentally, I should never have to say this, but I'm saying it because we live in Crazyville. We know how many genders there are, and there are two because God made them male and female. That's it. There's not a spectrum. There's not 60. There are two. That's all there are. We know the origin 
of evil. Where did evil come from? People often want to know. Go back to the book of Genesis, the serpent in the garden, and how that whole story unfolded. You understand that. We know that sin requires atonement because even from the time of Abel, where he's offering a sin sacrifice, all the way through, we see that sin has to be dealt with. We know that God is sovereign and you cannot thwart his will. No matter what you do, he will always accomplish it. We see that over and over. We also know that our loving, kind, compassionate God is also just and he will judge sin. He did it in the flood. He will do it again someday. You can bank on that. Speaking of the flood, you can just look around the topography of the world, how fossils of warm water sea creatures end up embedded in the rocks of high mountain ranges. I mean, there's there's stuff that doesn't make any sense if you go with an evolution um concept of how the world came about. But boy, if you know the flood story, you look around, you go, yeah, (laughs) totally makes sense to me. We know that there is but one race. It's the human race. It's humanity. But there are just many different people groups. And we talked about that at the Tower of Babel. And speaking of the Tower of Babel, we also now know the origin of different languages and how and why that happened. We understand the need for a Messiah, a Savior to save us from our sin. And we know that this is not the end, that there is more. I mean, we just read the prophecy of Jacob saying an everlasting king, you know, that the scepter will never depart and all the peoples of the world will be obedient to him. That's way, way, way out in the future at that point. Maybe not so far for us. We're not sure where we are on the prophetic timeline, but we know that there is more. So I want to encourage you with that. The book of Genesis is one of those books. I think you could read it front to back a million times, and there's still more to get out of it. So don't ever feel like, oh, we're done with it. I don't, well, never read that one again. I mean, read it again, go back and do it again. You'll see stuff that that you and I missed, you know, the, the last time we went through it. For our next Bible study, starting Lord willing, next Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern time on Bible Study Hub, Facebook, and YouTube, I feel strongly led to do the New Testament book of Galatians. One of the reasons I want to do Galatians is because we have just come through an amazing historical narrative, but I want to take a book that really delves into the question of what does it take to be right with God? In other words, what does it take to make sure when you die, you end up in heaven and not in hell? Is there a way to know? How do you know? What needs to happen? What's my part? What's God's part? What about other religions that have different perspectives on that and say different things? How do you know which one is right? Can you know which one is right? All of these really important questions are going to be dealt with in the book of Galatians, which is written by the Apostle Paul. If you were with us in the book of Acts or Colossians, you know that name because he was the main character, I would say, probably in most of the book of Acts. And he also penned the book of um, of Colossians as well as Galatians and others. All right. So hopefully you can join us next Monday night as we start the book of Galatians. It's going to be great. Thank you so much, as always, for hanging out with me on this Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Always love being with you, and I will look forward to seeing you next week with a brand new study. So have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.